a known history of asthma and diagnosed two years ago and is now admitted following shortness of breath and wheeze. What are the differentials of shortness and of breath and wheeze? These are mainly asthma, anaphylaxis and foreign body inhalation. Other possible causes though less likely to present with both shortness of breath and wheeze are MI, COPD, exacerbation, pulmonary edema, aortic stenosis, cardiac tamponade, PE, meta uh, metabolic acidosis, sepsis, pneumonia, and pneumothorax. Moving on to the ABCDE of management, starting with the airway as always, does the patient need airway support? Take note of Strider if present, as it suggests airway obstruction in anaphylaxis, and emergency measures such as intubation or adrenaline administration may be needed. Breathing. We note the respiratory rate and saturation. Start on high flow oxygen to keep saturations between 94 and 98%. Increased respiratory rate is seen in the early stages of asthma exacerbation, but if this continues, the patient tires, causing a fall in respiratory rate. This is a dangerous sign. Increased work of breathing can present with accessory muscle use, nasal flaring, and the tripod position, as shown on the right. The tripod position, when the arms are forward, and the patient leans forward, props the chest open, allowing for greater ventilation with less effort. A full respiratory exam should be performed, looking for signs of pneumothorax, especially attention pneumothorax, which requires urgent needle decompression. Reduced air entry suggests, suggests asthma, as does bilateral polyphonic wheeze. Peak flow should also be carried out as a peak flow expiratory as the PEFR of less than 33% of predicted suggests a life-threatening asthma attack. Dullness to percussion will point towards consolidation and pleural effusion due to pneumonia. So we, mo we move on to circulation now. We measure the pulse, blood pressure and capillary refill time. Tachycardia is concerning in an asthma exacerbation, whereas bradycardia is a pre-terminal event. A full cardiovascular exam should help rule out aortic stenosis, acute heart failure. We take bloods and get IV access at this stage. D. We check the GCS and the blood sugar. A quick note, when reporting GCSE to seniors, divide it into three separate categories such as E3, M4, V4, as it helps them see where the actual problem lies. E. Exposure. Carry out an abdominal examination, check temperature which is rele relevant in infection and look for any signs of DVT such as calf tenderness. Moving on to in initial investigations. ABG. Its usefulness in acute asthma attacks has been questioned, especially since the advantage of information gained over a VBG in regards to PCO2 is small and it comes without patient discomfort. As mentioned before, PACO2 initially decreases due to hyperventilation in acute asthma and if it becomes normal or high, it shows that the patient is becoming exhausted and this is a near-fatal exacerbation. Bloods. We check for anemia in severe cases. It can cause shortness of breath. Use the knees. We check for dehydration and we carry out potassium levels as salbutamol reduces serum potassium concentrations. Magnesium levels are also helpful when magnesium is being used to treat. White cell count and CRP for infection. Theophylline levels if on aminophilin. Vitamin D levels are useful to check as, a low, as low vitamin D levels can cause asthma flares. And IgE levels predict the need for Montelukast and Om Omalizumab. Um, but this is more applicable in the longer term, not the acute phase. As mentioned, peak flow helps identify the severity of an asthma attack. ECG changes in severe asthma attack include elongated P waves, wide axis deviation, wide bundle branch block. It is possible that some of these ECG changes are due to positional changes of the heart due to over distension of the lungs in acute asthma attack. Chest x-ray is normal in up to 75% of asthma sufferers, but reported features include pulmonary hyperinflation, bronchial wall thickening, and possible pulmonary edema. Any suspicion of severe asthma exacerbation, get senior help and involve tertiary care.
they may use magnesium or theophylline in a life-threatening attack. Initial management of an acute asthma exacerbation. Oxygen, we aim for 94 to 98. Salbutamol, 5 mg nebulized with oxygen, can be given every 10, 10 minutes if the initial response is poor. Hypertropium can be added to the um, salbutamol in 500 mg every 4 to 6 hours. Corticosteroids, if required, can be prescribed, namely prednisolone, 40 mg oral. Where the patient cannot swallow, we can use IV hydrocortisone. We continue this for five days. If infection is present, antibiotics, according to local guidelines, can also be prescribed. We also review medications as beta blockers and sedatives may need to be halted. It is important to continually reassess the patient for any signs of deterioration with peak flow readings and titrate oxygen to saturations. The patient should be put under a respiratory care team as definitive management. If possible, identify the trigger of the asthma exacerbation, which can include allergens, upper respiratory tract infections, tobacco, tobacco smoke, gourd, and stress. We continue regular nebulizers to keep the patient well. Salbutamol every four hours and hypertropin can be added 500 milligrams every six hours if required. After 24 hours, consider changing nebulized salbutamol to inhale and add high dose corticosteroids. So we continue 40 milligrams prednisolone for at least five days and inhale salbutamol as in the initial management. And we prescribe oxygen and form a prophylaxis such as from the Paranex 2.5 milligrams. Discharging the patient. This is acceptable when nebulized therapy is no longer required with beta 2 therapy being stretched to four hours comfortably. Prior to discharge, peak flow should be greater than 75% of predicted with less than 25% in di diurnal variation. Self-management self -management asthma plan should be given to the patient and the inhaler technique should be assessed. This is very important. Many patients simply puff and breathe in and breathe out. Correct technique involves taking a deep breath in. Whilst you're taking the deep breath in, you take a puff and hold for 10 seconds before exhaling. Repeat, um, repeat subsequent puffs after a minute. A Asthma specialist should also review the patient within 30 days. Peak flow dive is useful, especially for noting diurnal variations. So that was managing an acute asthma attack. Thanks again for watching. If you do have any questions, please do leave them in the comment section below. Thanks again.